Chapter 8 Mustafa Kemal went back to soldiering with energy. He was by instinct a soldier. He worked hard, organized staff rides and lectures, studied military history, built in the campaigns of Napoleon. It was a time of new enthusiasms and quick promotion. Before he was 30 he was chief of staff to the Third Army in Macedonia. In 1910 he was attached to the staff of General Ali Reza on a mission to France. He went first to Paris for a few days and then to the annual manoeuvres in Picardy. Ali Reza reported that he had shown marked ability and judgment, and was a go-ahead and clear-sighted officer. On his return he was put in charge of the officer school in Salonika. He reorganized the school with great efficiency, but he was dissatisfied and disgruntled. Though by instinct a soldier, Mustafa Kemal was forever hankering after politics, and in politics there was no place for him. Revolution had improved nothing. Anwar, Talat and Jamal, the men he had known on the committee in Salonika, were now the rulers. Javed, the renegade Jew, was misinster of finance. He despised them all. They were puny little men, unfit to rule. He made no secret of his views. He preached them both in the school and in public. The great powers, he said, were greedier than ever. Germany had her fingers on the throat of Turkey. The financiers were buying up concessions and rights. They already controlled the Baghdad Railway. Jarved had played the traitor and sold that to them. The best German diplomats were at work in Constantinople. Turkey was being sold to the foreigners, and especially to the Germans. The Turks must rule themselves without outside help or interference. Inside Turkey everything was as bad as before. Pay, organization and general conditions were as bad as under Abdul Hamid. Poverty was general, everywhere, and especially in the army, there was discontent, something must be done and done at once. Mustafa Kemal was now a senior officer. He was on the general staff. His reputation for efficiency was growing. In the garrison were many officers discontented and prepared for trouble. They began to listen to him, look up to him and group around him. His manner changed. To be the center, to be listened to and respected, braced him. He was as decisive and trenchant as who followed him. He was becoming a person of importance and the leader of a movement. His manner changed. To be the center, to be listened to and respected, braced him. He was as decisive and trenchant as ever, but he grew more expensive and even genial with those who followed him. He was becoming a person of importance and the leader of a movement. This was reported to Mahmud Shawkat Pasha, who was now Minister of War in Constantinople. He knew his man and the danger of trouble from Salonika and the Balkans. He must move Mustafa Kemal. He posted him as the officer commanding the 38th Infantry Regiment in Salonika, but this made no difference, for Mustafa Kemal did his military work above reproach. And even more officers began to stand in with him. He began to plan a more definite line of action, aiming at a coup d'etat and to organize for this. Once more his evenings were spent in secret meetings behind locked doors, but now he was the controlling mind and his opponents were the old revolutionaries of the committee who had become the rulers. His policy was for an efficient home government and the expulsion of the foreigners, Turkey for the Turks, was his war cry. The government agents reported that he was dangerous. The committee demanded his punishment. Mahmud Shawkat Pasha sent for him taxed him with inciting the troops to mutiny against the government. Not being satisfied with Mustafa Kemal's replies, and yet not having enough evidence to arrest him, 
he relieved him from command of his regiment, recalled him to Constantinople and placed him in the war office. It was difficult to know how to handle him. Warnings and threats were useless, the Mustafa Kemal was quite fearless. There was nothing that could be made into a charge against him, for he was circumspect. There was nothing that could be made into a charge against him, for he was very circumspect. In the war office at least he was away from the Balkan storm center and his friends, and he could be watched. In Constantinople there was still confusion, the politicians were still scrambling and intriguing for power, ministries were in and out of office weekly. Still there was no one man big enough to control. It had been possible for Mahmud Shokat Pasha, but at the decisive moment he had withdrawn. There was a party, led by Jamal of the committee, who were bitterly opposed to the Germans. They disliked the German instructors in the army. They hated von Wangenheim, the German ambassador and the friend of Anwar, a massive, brutal Prussian of a man, coarse and defiant, yet cunning and subtle. An engine of energy who worked effectively and ruthlessly to make Turkey an instrument of Germany. Mustafa Kemal found the politicians of this party friendly. He cultivated their acquaintance. He drank and gambled with them and talked with them by the hour, but he never got very far. He spent much of his time wandering on the edge of politics. He was always under the impression that very shortly they would recognize his value and invite him into their inner councils where he would become the dominating figure. But he had neither the mentality nor the experience for politics. Like soldiers in all countries, he sneered at politics and yet wished to take a hand in them. The politicians found him touchy and difficult, an explosive, churlish fellow. He bored them incessantly, for either he would out-talk them with a torrent of words or he would sit stubbornly and ill-naturedly silent. He had nothing to offer them. In Salonika he might have a following. In Constantinople he was almost unknown. He did not fit anywhere in the picture. Churlish fellow. He bored them incessantly, for either he would out-talk them with a torrent of words, or he would sit stubbornly and ill-naturedly silent. He had nothing to offer them. In Salonika he might have a following. In Constantinople he was almost unknown. He did not fit anywhere in the picture. They kept in touch with him, and encouraged him a little. He was by all reports an exceptional staff officer. He was certainly not the usual type of Turkish officer. He looked and behaved like a German with his clipped Prussian way of speaking, his blue eyes and his fixed stare. He might be useful one day against Stanwood and von Wangenheim's Germans. So Mustafa Kemal, as proud as Lucifer, went from door to door, almost cap in hand, to visit the second-class politicians. He was kept waiting in anti-rooms, sitting among the riffraff, flicking his long riding boots and growing more and more irritated. He despised these politicians, these rat men, yet he wanted to be in with them. If someone had attacked him, he would have been happy. Hatred always braced him. The casual indifference mixed with patronage stung his pride, yet left him helpless. In this aimless quest he began to eat his heart out. As an antidote he drank heavily and savagely. At that moment, in October, 1911 Italy, without warning, landed an expeditionary force in Tripoli in North Africa, seized the town and part of the coast.